Well, talk about groundbreaking, because I've been doing ups and downs for a long time, and we have never done one in terms of WWE when CM Punk has been a member of the roster. <laughs> 2023 has been totally wild. So we are not in Toto anymore, Kansas, and hello, my friends. Welcome to Ups and Downs, the show where some bald idiot goes, I like this, and he points his finger up there. And sometimes he goes, I don't like this, and he points his finger down there. Now, look, if you are new, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate it. But we are a positive Pete show. And that means when we do watch professional wrestling, we look for the good. You can still get mad in the comments. That's what they're there for. Hello, my friends. What are we doing? Let's up those downs. WWE was also trying to get everybody hyped because the first hour of Raw was commercial free. And they basically spent three hours going, oh my gosh, CM Punk is going to be here and he's going to cut a promo. And let's not forget, he's really controversial. Before that though, bam, Randy Orton also returned to Raw. So I'm wearing this t-shirt today because I thought to myself, I am feeling very warm and fuzzy in my tum tum. Now a huge reason for this is because before Orton did his pose, you could just see it in his face, this man was so emotional. If you do go out there and read all of the reports, apparently his back injury was so bad, there was a chance he would never return to the ring. And here he is. He was also making up for lost time, which is why when his phone rang and it was Cody Rhodes, he was like, oh, hello, Cody. Of course I'll be in war games. I've been wrestling for a long time, but I've never done that match. A tick for the CV. Moving on to more pressing matters, because yeah, let's not forget the mother flubbers who did take him out for so long, also known as the bloodline. This is when he got to teasing, because he was like, I have a receipt for every single one of them. I was like, well, wait a minute. Roman Reigns needs an opponent for the Royal Rumble. And if we do Orton versus Roman, well, you could plug me in. Or hook it to my veins, I suppose. <laughs> that was a pun. Somebody's so gonna punch me in the face. When, of course, Randy Orton got interrupted. I mean, it is Monday Night Raw. That's like a rite of passage, and it was Rhea Ripley. <laughs> so I would presume that WWE is well aware of the Judgment Day meme, although Rhea had some interesting things to say, because she was like, Randy, you looked so great at the Survivor Series, but you know, you did get upstage instantly. And she was talking about CM Punk. It also thinks he was in recruitment mode here because he was like, look, forget about the bloodline. The Judgment Day has rose to the top ever since you have been away. And Damian Priest and Finn Balor are the tag team champions. Don't forget, that was your prized possession before you did get taken out. So maybe you want to come hang out with us in our clubhouse. <laughs> Imagine if she had said that. Like Bart Simpson and Ralph Wiggum. Ripley was pissed though, because let's not forget it was Orton who stopped Damian Priest from cashing in his money in the bank. So essentially, do you want to take the easy way or do you want to take the hard way? Randy was all like, oh, look, it's the mammy. Well, I've got bad news for you. Daddy's home. Not only did he pick the hard way, I think he may have picked the kinky way too. It really made me laugh, though, because Rhea's big reply was, that's it, you've made an enemy now. It's like what a robot would say if you went, man, I've turned my back on you. When, of course, in teleported in Dominic Mysterio and in teleported JD McDonut, and they whipped Randy Orton's ass. Well, for a little while anyway, because McDonough was then dropped with the RKO, as Randy was like, hey, Dom, I wouldn't leave this evening because I'm going to go see Adam Pearce, and the main event tonight is going to be you versus me. <laughs> it's just so damn good. Like, if I was going to write a match down on paper, eventually that one would come out. And to be honest with you as well, Randy Orton could have come out here and just told me about how much he loved his cats. I'd still be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Sometimes you don't need to do much. Getting it up. When we had an even better return from Survivor Series, because our truth is also back. Now this was just a set of the mad number one contender tag team Gorton that we were about to do, because the Alpha Academy were here, and the New Day, and DIY, and everybody else. But we also had Jelly Roll, multi-platinum selling artist, or whatever the hell WWE said. Now because Truth had heard that there was some Jelly Rolls, he walked in going, wait, it's time to eat. When everyone tried to explain, no, 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 Jelly Roll, is an actual person. Truth is like, listen, I have to go to catering to find the jelly rolls. Listen, it is so, so stupid. But so am I. I'm giving it up. He made me happy in about 3.2 seconds. Didn't have done it. Tazawa also danced and farted after this. I'll let you into a little secret about Simon Miller. Didn't really need that in my life. Fart jokes don't really make me laugh. Here we are. It also meant that it was time to do this gauntlet. And if you can believe it, somebody, Triple H, I suppose, looked at the Creed and was like, listen, we've just called you up from NXT and we need to establish you. 
So yeah, they went and absolutely smashed it. When it comes to Julius and Brutus as well, I just have to say, they have something about them. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but it's a bit like this. Because ah! they just roll out there and it's chaos. Wonderful, wonderful chaos. They weren't in straight away though, because instead we were doing the Alpha Academy versus DIY. But because the Academy was Tazawa and Otis, well, they kind of just got beaten really quickly. Probably why Chad Gable wasn't in it. I mean, this couldn't have gone more than three minutes. Did somebody say three minutes. So mostly Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa just took out Otis's leg, because he is a big guy, and if he can't walk, he can't move. When they hit the meat in the middle onto Tazawa, he wasn't able to dance and fart anymore, and they beat him. One, two, three. Well, I suppose this was fine. Like, I can't get mad at it. And again, because we had so many matches, some of them were going to have to go fast. So I will give it an up. But then I was absolutely dying. Because Inda Sheer also returned to Raw, meaning Veer came all over Monday nights. And they too only lasted about 120 seconds. In terms of, like, kayfabe, they suck. For sure, they were smashing DIY for a little bit where they just hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up on Veer. And he kind of just looked off into the distance like, well, that didn't go well at all. So for all the wrong reasons, this really made me chuckle. That's all I need in my life. I just need to be entertained and give it an up. Now I do admit, how could anybody actually care about that? Because industry haven't been presented as anything. But then it was time for the Creeds versus DIY. And I tell you, the only disappointing thing with this is that it only went five minutes. I would have taken double. As ever though, Brutus went absolutely nuts when DIY did try for meat in the middle, when Julius was just grabbing them and throwing them around like kids. Don't throw around kids. Ah! Donny then got absolutely murdered by a bomb of power. Well, yeah, they did the Brutus bomb. They got the one, two, three. I was kind of surprised by that because I thought maybe DIY would win, but they didn't, which just kind of leave us in an interesting position. Because on the one hand, push the creeds, but on the other, at the moment on the main roster, DIY ain't doing much of anything, but we'll wait and see. It also built to a big clash after this, because then it was the Crees taking on the New Day, and the New Day should always be presented as one of the greatest teams of all time. Put respect on Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston's name. It just meant more madness too, because at one point Kofi dived at Julius, who just rolled through and DVD'd his ass. Well, not his ass, I suppose he DVD'd his head, but once again, they have scary strength, I don't think they actually know it. Brutus then saw Woods on the outside, so he moonsaulted him when they hit another Brutus bomb and they got another Uno Dos Tres. So they were kind of running wild here. And I kind of feel like even though the fans weren't making a lot of noise, if you keep doing stuff like this, eventually you'll be like, oh my gosh, they're such a good team. That's how you build someone up. It also meant there was one last hurdle or one last final boss. Here came Imperium. Luther Kaiser was no nonsense too, so he was raking at people's eyes, meaning he was trying to blind them. When Julius went to do this superplex, he jumped to the top rope and he fell down. So do you know what he did? Without even hesitating, he just leapt back onto Tina the turnbuckle and he did it. Now look, everyone is going to make mistakes, but to rectify it that quickly, you just got to give him a round of applause. This too opened the door for another Brutus bomb, which they did hit, and again, they got the win. So they kind of wrecked all of these teams. My eyebrows started to go up, because now they're going to face the Judgment Day. And could they do it? Maybe they could. So we really didn't paint it like they were a big deal. And if we do come up with a good finish, or we give them the championships, well, we will have absolutely done it. Mr. Burns has won it. Give it an up. We got right into more teasing after this. Flub me, does WWE like a good tease? Because Finn Balor found Damien Priest to tell him, hey Damien, we've got brand new tag team challenges. But Damien was like, look, can't really talk about anything right now. Feeling quite sad. My reason we lost at Judgment Day, not at Survivor Series. The rest of the group were all like, no, don't be silly, Mr. Priest. We're one big family. And that was actually said like this. Really sorry I hit your car, Grandad. I didn't mean to. Ah, don't worry about it, little Jimmy. But if I were you, I'd keep your eyes open when you sleep. Ah! Priest then also asked about JD McDonough, who was at a local medical facility or in a local medical room. So Rhea was like, maybe you should go check on him. And when Damo did leave, she looked at him like, I don't think you're working anymore. This guy is totally, totally screwed. Hour two then started, and how do you keep the flow going? Send out Cody Rhodes. So there were some mad people on the internet that were going, oh man, now that Randy Orton and CM Punk are back, Cody is totally screwed. It's like, what world are you living in? He came out, everybody went crazy, 
And he's still the top baby face in the company. He also thanked every single member of his War Games team, especially Randy Orton. Because without Randy, they wouldn't have won. But also, there would be no Cody Rhodes. He's his mentor. I mean, they were in Legacy. He also then got super sad because, of course, it was Randy that threw Damian Priest to Cody as he hit the crossroads to get the 1-2-3. Which means not only were his boys victorious, but he had won in his father's match. I was like, yeah, that's pretty damn poignant. He also welcomed Punk back, which I found very interesting, when he started to talk about fishermen. I was like, I don't understand what's going on here, but I like to pretend that I do know. So I was like, yeah, Cody, those fishermen, man, no idea. Maybe he just fancied some trout and he couldn't help himself, but he did have a big announcement. So given that January is just around the corner, he is happy to say he is going into the Raw Rumble. Can't lie, a pop. We're then going to continue this ride because all of a sudden Shinsuke Nakamura appeared on the big screen and he started talking in riddles again saying, oh my gosh, Cody Rhodes, you were the man I needed to awaken me. So he actually did sound like he was in Final Fantasy. So it turns out the whole time Shinsuke has been talking about Rhodes and while I made some stupid opinion that it was going to be Randy Orton given that he was coming back, actually when you do go through these, it does make sense. And when I let it hit my interest gland, I was like, Actually, I do want to see Shinsuke Nakamura versus Cody Rhodes. I've never seen it before. As was the way on this Raw 2, all of a sudden Shinsuke just appeared behind Cody. When he turned around, he went and spat the mist into his face. As we've already talked about, this is a different wrestling company. So when you are misted, you don't become the dark, evil version of yourself. Maybe one day. It does make sense, though, because of course Cody needs something as we head into Mania season. And again, I think we'll have some damn good matches. Shinsuke Nakamura. <laughs> will definitely lose, which we should probably stop doing, but up. And then WWE must have gone and read my mind, because it was time for big men <laughs> slapping man meat. Because it was Bronson Reed versus Ivar, and like a conversation I was having the other day, I love that this has re-entered the wrestling sphere. Like, all of a sudden, there are so many human beings, myself included, that just want to see two big slabs of meat meeting each other so we can see their meat. What? They were just throwing each other around when Valhalla was casting voodoo distraction. <laughs> which meant Ivar just hit Reed with this massive kick. But when Valhalla was like, do a moonsault, do a moonsault, he listened to her. That was stupid. He totally missed. Otherwise, there was just so many sentons and slams. And when Bronson went for the tsunami, he wasn't able to do it because Valhalla was back going, whoa, look at me, look at me. Finally, the referee was like, listen, Valhalla, damn it. I'm trying to watch some man meaty slapping here. Would you leave? She got cast out. By this point, these two behemoths were fighting on the outside, though, when they went crashing into Barry Barricade. And because they were being so damn powerful, they didn't hear the ref. He got to 10, so they both got counted out. Now, usually, that would be a lame finish. But this is when Bronson Reed got a security guard, and he launched him at Ivar. That's like, screw the count out. Keep giving me this. Ivar also jumped off a box-like structure, so this is getting so crazy. And it took around about 79,422 officials to calm them down. So now I guess we get to do this again next week. Yes. In fact, what I actually do for at least 12 months is want a show. That's right. Probably by then, I'd get a little bit bored of it. But for now, it's getting it up. You need it. Nia Jax then decided the best use of her time was to find Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark. Be like, oh, Zoe, you did really well on Saturday, didn't you? I don't think she meant it. So this was basically just a way to set up a match for those two later on in the show. And to remind you that Shayna and Zoe are sort of best friends that talk really passive-aggressively to each other. When Raw peaked, I mean it. Because the Judgment Day returned to their lair, and who was sitting there just eating desserts, being the happiest man ever? It was, of course, our truth I absolutely love this guy. So somebody should make him the damn leader, and he even said here, oh man, Judgment Day, I hear you're going to be in war games, why don't I be a part of your group? They were like, man, that was the other day, damn it. Did you know how Truth responded? He was like, oh man, how did it go? Again, just hug him. They then kicked him out of there because they were so upset, and I think next week, we're getting JD McDonough versus our truth we are just living on the craziest timeline there is. When Nia Jax defeated Zoe Stark. I didn't see this coming. Now Zoe was able to hit her with a springboard clothesline, which was pretty cool, when Nia kind of grabbed her and just crushed her into the floor. When we did the classic, Jax ran into the corner and Stark got out the way. So once again, we're using Batman Arkham Asylum tactics. So we then went after the leg, because as ever, if you can't walk, you probably can't wrestle. And she tried to hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, but it didn't work. 
That's when she was out of ideas. Because she went to the top rope, Nia crotched her, gave a Samoan drop, which is okay because she is Samoan, hit the Annihilator, and she just won. One, two, three. This is what happened to me. I froze in perpetual motion. Because here is the deal. I like Nia Jax, and I think she gets a hard end of the stick by most people. She's a pretty good monster. But Zoe Stark just lost at the Survivor Series, and at the moment, it's kind of doing a lot of nothing. Now, I do believe that we're going to do Nia versus Becky Lynch soon, so this does tie in. You need to give Jax some wins. But it didn't have to be against Zoe Stark. So even though I thought this match was perfectly fine, my nerd side kicked in, and I'm giving it a down. I think Zoe Stark should be getting some Ws soon. She's really, really good. So it is just pure storyline stuff, and you like what you like, and you also like what you don't like. I got something wrong there. Point is, it's getting it down. Gunther was then back with his kids after this, and he does not like DIY. I mean, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, it's not like he was like, man, I gotta go put up some shelves. He was basically telling Giovanni Vinci and Ludwig Kaiser to sort them out, though, and Giovanni was like, yes, sir, I'll do whatever I can. When Ludwig took over, because of course he fell out with Gunther, and now he's trying to be like, oh, yeah, daddy, I'll make sure this happens. Once again, it does kind of feel like we're gonna split up Imperium, and if it was me, well, I wouldn't do it. Miz then decided he was going to yell at Gunther, which can't be a good idea. But he was like, look, I know I lost to you at the pay-per-view premium live event, but I saw your press conference afterwards, and you said you wanted your next opponent to challenge you face-to-face. I was like, that's not what you do, Miz. You just press start. Now, the ring general basically flicked him away here. Like, look, you do belong in the ring. You just don't belong in the ring with me. But it does kind of feel like we're going to do this again. Do we need to do it again? I would say no. We shall see. When things got really good, and it kind of feels to me like nobody has cottoned on to this, that doesn't make any sense. Because Seth Rollins walked to the ring, and almost by magic, everybody in this building started to chant for CM Punk. And I was like, here we go. Because Seth goaded them on when he just totally flipped. He was like, look, I will address CM Punk by saying, I don't want to spend any more time on that hypocrite. And then he just left it. I could feel it in my tootsie toes. I was like, oh man, we are going to come back to this. We'll talk about it later. Instead, Rollins wanted to talk about his World Heavyweight Championship, which is now the most important title in the industry. <laughs> That's not true at all. Although, of course, he has to believe it, because if he doesn't, how can we? He does still feel pretty beaten up after war games when Drew McIntyre interrupted, because, of course, it is Monday Night Raw. And he did some wink, wink, nudge, nudge, too, because he was like, oh, Seth, did you see the internet and both our reactions to a certain someone? So we are cooking this fire. He did want to congratulate him for him winning at the Survivor Series, though, while also saying, man, Judgment Day, they sucked. And interestingly, they shook hands. I was like, well, this is not going to go well at all. Because mostly Drew feels like he needs a bit of a refocus, so he's ignoring Jay Uso, who's just a thorn in his side. Because right here, right now, he understands what Seth Rollins was saying. At Crown Jewel, it was McIntyre's mistake, which cost him the championship. But now he wants a round two. Yes. He also told us this story that during war games, he felt a bit sorry for Seth Rollins, who had been beaten up, going, man, man, that guy has a family, that guy has a daughter. But then when he tried to help him, Seth just slapped him in the face. I was like... Drew, you're in war games. What do you think was going to happen? I mean, it's not like he was going to bust at a picnic. And while Seth actually agreed, yeah, man, you do deserve another shot at it. It ain't going to be for a while because I've already got a new opponent next week who will be challenging for it. I was like, oh, man, this ain't going to go well at all. McIntyre understood this, although he was desperate to know who it was. And Seth was like, <laughs> it's Jay Uso. That's when the Scottish warrior went really, really mad. Because that's right, next week on Raw, it is going to be Seth Rollins versus Jay Uso. Even though Rollins was going to explain how this happened. Like Seth, you don't need to do that. I watched WWE. Jay Uso would have just walked up to Adam Pearce and gone, geese title shot. Adam Pearce would have gone, ha ha, you got it. McIntyre wasn't interesting anyway, though, because he took his head and he butted Seth Rollins so hard that he kind of nicked the title a little bit. And this madman was bleeding. He then finished Rollins off by saying, what are you talking about? I beat Jay Uso two weeks ago, so this doesn't make any sense. And he's right. It is two plus two equals potato. This is why the Drew Hill turn has been so good. Every word that comes out of his mouth, you're like, show me the lie. Uso then did make the say, which allowed him and Rollins to do a double super kick to get Drew out of there. So maybe we're kind of going to do some kind of three-way here. Although then we had a brand new food because McIntyre went to the back. And Sammy Zayn popped up. Now, bless Sammy for always trying to find the good in people because he was like, listen, Drew, nobody understands what you're going through more than me. We have the same situations. But whereas I've moved on, 
Well, you're being a little bit of a negative Nancy. He also reminded Drew that he has so much to be thankful for because he is a two-time champion and really jacked. That made me laugh. But at the moment, he's being a spoiled brat. So you can imagine how Drew McIntyre reacted. He was like, oh, I'm being a spoiled brat, am I? So he's going to Adam Pearce and he's going to sort out a match for next week. So this was some damn good sports entertaining, especially because we've set up Drew as the centerpiece here. And who knows in what direction we are going to head, but it was just so well done, it is getting it up. When Chelsea Green and Piper Niven successfully defended their tag team titles. It was fine. They were facing Tegan Knox and Natalia, and you know the deal. They were throwing each other into Barry Barricade because they are all horrible people. When Piper Niven saw this, and she did a massive cannonball off the apron, she killed everyone. Tegan also did the Molly go round because Molly Holly is great. When she just got slammed with the ultimate comeback move of 2023, the crossbody courtesy of Piper, and she just got pinned. Bless Chelsea Green, she reacted like she just won the lottery. And the only issue here is that it's quite clear the fans do not care about these belts. The only way to make them care is to build them back up again and actually come up with some challenges that feel like they're going to win. So it is a work in progress, but look, it was all right. No harm, no foul. Give it up. Also, by the way, I meant to say that's mostly because there were no shenanigans here. Sometimes having the champions win in a champion-like way, but hopefully it will serve you well down the line. When Jay Uso took a huge risk, he went and had a chat with Randy Orton. Dun, dun, dun. And he did thank Orton for helping out at the pay-per-view premium live event, and he wanted to apologize to him. I know it was the bloodline that took you out, and I shouldn't have done it. Now, I really like Jay Uso, because he always sounds so sincere when he is doing these promos, and he was using Cody Rhodes as a make-weight. He was like, yeah, you like Cody, and he believes in me. Please, will you believe in me too? Now, Randy was totally fine with this, as long as Jay is out of the bloodline, and they did shake hands. But once again, I would keep your eye on this. I think something is going to happen. We then had a Becky Lynch interview after this, and she showed us her face, which is all scarred up from war games. I was like, well, that's why you don't get involved in games that are war. She also hinted that her and Charlotte Flair are officially good again. So once again, you've got to raise your eyebrow to that. And said she knows she has a couple of big fights coming up. Didn't really tell us who that was going to be. But again, given what happened earlier, I do believe it is Nia Jax. And do you want to know what happened after this too? <laughs> Michael Cole just diss Dominic Mysterio's physique. Yep. Because he was talking about how jacked Randy Orton is now. What is it? Oh, maybe Dom should go to the gym with him. It's like, so unfair. Don't body shame people, it's not nice. It did mean that Orton's first singles match proper was against Dominic Mysterio. This is just tied up 2023 in a nice little package. You never know what you're gonna get. Randy is still nuts though, so he was gonna throw Dom Dom into out of the announce table when Mysterio cut him off and pushed him into Simba the Still Steps. And Orton sold this like he was dead. He's so damn good. It didn't really help Dominic because he got wrecked with the power slam when Orton was going to hit the RKO. But of course, JD McDonough was out there, so he saved his friend. This is when Jelly Roll had moved to ringside and he got into it with the Judgment Day and he pushed them both down. Once again, I was like, this is the most mad episode of Raw ever. It's Jelly Roll. It also opened the door for Randy to throw the condom into Adam the announce table, which he did. And the fans were going, do it again, do it again. So he did it again. The version of Randy Orton is the absolute best. He then basically DDT JD McDonough when he slammed Dominic with the RKO and he got the one, two, three. So it was a dominant victory, but that's why this was so smart. Randy can always win. Dominic can always lose. And everybody feels good inside. Give it an up. Right. And then we arrive, probably the main reason you have tuned into Ups and Downs today. We had around about 10 minutes left on Raw, and here came CM Punk. Now, first and foremost, it blew my brain. I know we had everything with AEW, which we've talked about verbatim, but given how Punk left WWE, I never thought I would see this. So I was just staring at it going, have I gone on drugs? Am I dreaming? How the flub has this happened? Now, I do feel like this was deliberately held back, and we're going to talk about it in just one second, when he was like, oh, hell must have frozen over. But actually went down there and checked, still pretty hot, when CM wanted to talk about two specific words. And can you believe it? Those words were <laughs> Repo Man. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Now, of course, it was I'm home. <laughs> Look, I totally get it. I responded the same way. As soon as he did say that, I just shouted out, what? Because when you break down everything that has happened over the last decade, that is absolutely redonkulous. However... I think that's the point. Now, look, if I am wrong, cool. I'm always wrong. My parents didn't even mean to have me. So my whole life has been themed about being wrong. But given that Punk was also saying things like, oh my gosh, you never forgot me, even when I wanted to forget myself. Well, I think this goes back to what Seth Rollins was saying. 
Eventually, these two are going to clash. Rollins is going to bring all of this up and say, listen, you absolute goober, you are a massive hypocrite. He also mentioned how almost everybody in the back has been super kind to him. And even mentioned that AJ Lee is doing well. He doesn't usually talk about her in these kind of a things. When he also referenced Paul Heyman as the wise man, because years ago, Paul had gone, listen, he's going to have to go away to come back to find what he wants. And damn it, as Punk admitted, he was right. So there's another tease. He then started speaking about the brass ring in his pocket. Once again, I was like, ah, oh, here we go. Because for the last 10 years, there have been a bunch of superstars who have tried to be the best in the world. Because, of course, CM Punk is the best in the world. But now Punk is back in WWE. And he's the best wrestler. And he's the best on promos. All these dudes are totally bold. They are afraid that Punk has set the bar too high. And once again, he is back again. When he got all the fans to shout his name. And he did the mic drop. Then he turned to the camera and he said, I'm not here to make friends, I'm here to make money. And I was like, I'm sorry, that basically switches everything that just came out of his mouth. And look, I get it too. Given that it was his first time back with all the other crazy stuff, you want carnage, you want chaos, and you watch Dr. Robotnik. But over the last two years, WWE has just been so patient with this stuff. I think they're doing it again and they're going to drip feed it and try and make you tie all the way in. So I really do think they're building just something bigger here, which means patience is a virtue. And once again, if I'm totally incorrect, you can come call me a bald idiot. So it isn't up for me, mostly, because I couldn't believe my eyes. This is another situation where CM Punk could have come out and said, I'm just going to read the dictionary, go like, and after alternate. I've got to, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Because deep down, I am a massive nerd. Also, I've just got this bee in my bonnet. I think we're going to look back on this in a month and be like, holy crap, that was like a tease within a tease. As I've told you throughout this show, WWE loves a tease. So I just feel like I'm living in Narnia. It is a little bit cold in here. It also means that when we get to the end of Raw, I am going to give it an up, mostly because Randy Orton and CM Punk were on the show. And now there's murmurings that Sasha Banks may come back. If that happens, I'm just going to lay down and hibernate throughout the winter because my excitement won't be able to handle this. Now, of course, please do click the video on the screen, which is Ups and Downs for Survivor Series to make sure you continue on your WWE Ups and Downs journey. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Let me know what you thought about Raw in the comments. And yeah, let's just enjoy this. Again, never say never is 100% the motto of professional wrestling. And I'm never going to say never again. Goodbye.